building muscle after menopause is not only possible, but also necessary unless you've been a bodybuilder or avid weightlifter and eaten a high protein diet and dialed both of those up during perimenopause, chances are you have lost muscle tissue since your 30s. I'm Deborah Atkinson. I founded Flipping 50, and you are listening to The Flipping 50 Show, where I address your top struggles and concerns, but most of all, hope to inspire you to change the way you age, the way you think about it, so you can take actions to change the way you age. I address what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset so that you can have the energy and vitality that you want, need, and deserve in this second and better half. If you are not strength training, my friend, please listen. If you are strength training, this will reinforce what you're already doing. And if you have a friend who is not strength training, who you hope will grow old and play with you in your 80s and 90s, please share this. It really helps, yes, us, all of us, when we spread the word, because then we're not swimming upstream dealing with our own resistance to having the time or the energy to exercise. But we have others believing, hey, you need to make time for this. Let's do this together. And that, my friends, is what we all need. Okay. This means a loss of fat burning potential if you've lost muscle. And it means a slower metabolism. The most powerful positive impact of muscle on your postmenopausal health is the ability it allows you to burn more calories at any activity around the clock. And I mean sitting, which I don't know about you, but I'm sitting recording this and I sit a lot. This is just one of the positive things that muscle building does for you, but another positive superpower of your muscle is its ability to control blood sugar levels. With more muscle, you would have better blood sugar control thanks to the muscle being a bigger bank for storing sugar for your energy later. Without it, you only have the liver, which can easily become full. Like, okay, no room left at the end, and it's overloaded, leaving blood sugar levels higher for longer. And during those times, you're driving inflammation up and fat storage up. Building muscle after menopause, though, takes focus. Without consciously paying attention to preserving muscle at least and gaining muscle at best, you may have exercised, but without measurable results. That brings me to something we have to focus on first, measuring Are you measuring? Are you measuring the right thing? Because it is not showing up on the scale alone, girl. I'll link to three unique smart scales to choose from. A smart scale measures not just your weight, but your body composition. And the body composition measure can be divvied up into visceral body fat. It can be divvied up into fat and muscle by limb to see if you are actually balanced. You have the same muscle tissue on the right as in the left. Most of us don't, but you don't want it to be too far off in left field. So, Almost every one of us, I believe, should have one of those in our homes anymore. The pandemic taught us that. Weight alone, it's inconclusive, and it can lead you to falsely believe that you're making positive change. In fact, weight loss that is a high percent of muscle is a detriment to your metabolism and actually to burning fat. To gain muscle postmenopausal, and better yet, during or before menopause, so you're simply adjusting your dose of exercise as you proceed through menopause, you have five ingredients to pay attention to. These five items are crucial, and it's like love, hope, faith, you know, all those things. But the greatest of these is, yeah, see if you can guess. I can't stand it. It's resistance training, really. So even if I'm talking lifting weights, eating high quality, high protein, taking essential amino acids, sleeping, 
and recovery from exercise. And I'll talk more about that as we go through. Let me break down each one of these. So let's talk about lifting weights. You want to be lifting weights in this way to temporary muscular fatigue. That means if I assign you, you're going to do 15 repetitions. By 13, 14, and 15, you should be saying, oh my goodness, this is getting heavy. I I think I'm cheating. I'm not quite sure. I'll finish. But here's what happens. It's temporary muscle fatigue. When you get like that, it's like, oh my gosh, I got to put this down. I got to put this down. And then you do put it down and 30 seconds later, you can come back. It's like you've had moving day before, right? You're carrying the box, you're carrying the box or the couch or the whatever. And it's like, wait, honey, I have to put it down just for a minute. I have to rest my arms. And then you can pick it up and you can keep moving it in. It's that temporary like, oh, got to. You need to reach that every single set. And here's what happens often or did until we really began talking about it, at least inside our community, women premeditate. I'm doing three sets. So it means that by the end of that third set, I should really reach fatigue. No. No. (laughs) Set number one. And then we deal with set number two. And you might need to pick up a different weight. You might be weaker on set number two. You might be stronger. I don't know. And you have to see. You also need multiple sets. So two sets is better than one, but it's not as good as three. Three seems to be the sweet spot. And if you occasionally can do a fourth or even a fifth set, Sometimes choosing a very few exercises and doing more sets with them when you are very short on time has a better impact on the ability of that workout to positively impact your fat burning and your metabolism. Important distinction, right? Now, if you have 45 minutes to spend, you can, in more muscle groups, do three and maybe four sets on some of those, and that would be better. But let's say you've got 15 minutes. If you chose a push, a pull, and a leg exercise, that might be a chest press, it might be a bent over row and a squat. And maybe in between you put um, one plank that you're going to do so that you get adequate rest before you come around to the next one. But if you did those four things, right, three major strength exercises and a core exercise, four exercises, and you chose to do them four different times, now you're going to have a little time in transition, I realize, but four times four is 16. In 16 minutes of specifically lifting, you have more work done that is metabolism boosting than if you said, I'm going to choose eight to 10 exercises for all my major muscle groups, because that for years has been the advice, the guideline. When you're short on time, you also want to shrink the exercises, but increase the volume on those that you do. So take that pocket hit. You really need to know that. So the two things to really remember about lifting weights, make sure you get to muscular fatigue. That's if you're lifting a heavy weight, it'll take fewer reps. If you are doing, uh, need to do a lighter weight for safety or for a condition you have, it'll take more repetitions. And you have to abide by that, right? So if you have a limiter, you can't say, oh, but for bone density, I need heavier. You have to say for safety, (laughs) And for not being injured and to be able to continue to exercise, what do I need to do? So to temporary fatigue, no matter what your weight is, lighter or heavier, and you do multiple sets. Okay. Heavy is best, but if you're limited by those conditions or joints, light and more reps are better. More is not better. Hearing people say, I lift weights every day or four days a week, that is not a good thing. My eyebrows go up and I am biting my tongue. I am trying to determine, do I know this person well enough to spare them from the mistake that they're making if their goal is to age well with more muscle? And sometimes I have to say no, because some people do not want advice. They want to continue believing they know the way to do it, and they do not want to be told that they were wrong, even if it costs them years or metabolism. Yes. Okay. Don't be that person. Then eat your ideal body weight in pounds in grams of protein a day. So we're moving on to number two, protein, right? So I say it again, your ideal body weight, 
right? And if you don't know exactly what that would be, I mean, think to the time when, if you've had this in your life, that you felt good. You felt like, I've got all the energy I need. I can do all the things I need. I don't have to starve or consciously, consciously, constantly think about calories or what I'm eating or what I'm not eating. I don't have to think, oh, I got to exercise that off because number one, it doesn't work like that. False beliefs, even if they've lasted decades, don't make it true. Okay. So bookend your workouts though, now more than ever with high protein meals, meaning come into a workout fed, break your fast. I know it's conflicting evidence, but there is no scientific proof that exercising in a fasted state helps you burn more fat. We know that it stresses your system more. And we also know it does nothing positive for your muscle. You may be able to maintain it, but all you're doing is waffling back and forth between I'm fasting, but that's causing me to lose muscle. Now I'm lifting weights. And if I rest adequately between, I'm going to be gaining muscle. You're just catching up. You're not getting ahead. So you've got to think about what are my top priorities right now and create the ideal schedule. Could you still fast? Yes. You're not going to lift weights every day. Could you fast on the other days a little bit longer and and not have that you know, breakfast? Yes, you could. All right. But just be intelligent. And it's actually better for you to have days like that where you do fast and you don't fast and change your schedule. Otherwise, you lose metabolic flexibility and you need that desperately. Those of you who are just OCD about, sorry, love you, said with respect, about your schedule. Like, no, I eat at this time every day and I have to. Like, no, you don't. I mean, have you ever had to have a blood test and so you didn't eat at the same time? I mean, sometimes it just can't happen. And sometimes those are the best ways to have to force yourself to change, right? It's like you don't want to pay for that twice, that test, and wait the time that you would have to retest. So it's possible. It's just you don't want to. Maybe it's not convenient, but change usually isn't. So protein again to recap that, dosed in at least 30 grams of protein at each meal or snack. You're going to eat your ideal body weight in pounds per grams of protein a day. So I would say I want to be at about 125. Now I may or may not get to that, but about 125, and that's not a drastic change from where I'm at right now. So I want to eat 125 grams of protein a day divided by 30 at least. Now, sometimes some meals I can get 40 or I can even get 50, depending on what it is. A lot of protein will make you full very fast. And so I can't always get it, but it just depends on how big is my appetite and what is the food. (laughs) Have you ever noticed that? You know, it's like kids, I'm too full. I can't eat any more green beans. Oh, but there's ice cream. I have room for dessert. Yeah, totally. And maybe that's not just kids. Huh? Yeah. There's that. But if it's scallops or shrimp, I probably can, I could get in a little bit more because those are some of my favorites, right? But if it's, you know, just it's a piece of meatloaf, I'll, no, thank you. I am kind of full, not really hungry. I could eat other things maybe on my plate, but not that. So we're all like that a little bit. But how do I have to think about that? Well, if I can get 40 grams of protein at breakfast, I can kind of do that in my smoothie pretty easily. And I can get 40 again at dinner. I'm at 80. But where where does that leave me? I still have 45 more. So chances are I'm either going to have to, and we'll get there, have uh, an essential amino acid supplement during the day to give me another dose that would be like equivalent to having 30 grams of protein and or I'm going to have to try to bump it up or I'm going to have a like a shake after uh, a workout. So I might have breakfast and lunch, dinner, and a time during the day when I'm having a shake as well. And I know some of you are thinking, oh God, that's a lot of calories. If you add it up and you're eating healthfully, it's probably fewer calories than you think. And you know, 
if you've been exercising regularly, consistently for around two years, you need to be in a caloric surplus to gain muscle. And this is what probably is the downfall of a lot of you who will say, I've been lifting this consistently, but I'm not gaining any muscle and I'm not losing any weight. Well, you have to gain muscle to have more metabolism, to want to be more active, to be more energetic. And that will help you lose weight, right? You have to be in that. But if you're constantly in a caloric deficit, you're not eating enough calories overall, and you're not eating enough protein or not eating enough protein, it will be hard for for you to put on muscle, hard for you to increase your metabolism. Muscle is the only metabolically active tissue that you have. Fat is not. So I know you want to lose fat and gain muscle at the same time, but you can't do them as easily if you try the traditional ways of losing fat. Focus on muscle gain, focus on muscle gain, focus on muscle gain. You will be successful if you do the things that help you do it. Now, you might gain strength without gaining muscle. That we see in the literature that it's very true. Even people who are fasted can sometimes gain strength, but they don't gain any lean muscle mass. So again, that's helpful for you to gain strength. You're doing more work probably when you exercise each time. But if you don't gain the lean muscle tissue, you haven't really boosted your metabolism and the burning of fat that happens around the clock, even when you're sleeping. So back to protein, you want to bookend your workouts, go into it fed, eat uh, high protein afterward. Ideally, 90 minutes is about the sweet spot for muscle protein synthesis. It's not necessarily like within 30 minutes, not unless you're training for a marathon or an Ironman and you're regularly exercising once a day at minimum, twice a day, others, and that's not recommended, but some of you may be doing it. And you want to consciously boost your protein intake for 24 hours after. And think of it as if you were taking medication, you have to take it regularly, consistently, don't miss it. So you may want to take that, you know, like every three to four hours, think if I haven't had something with protein in it, it's probably time for me to do that. Because you've got to remember we're losing muscle much easier than we're gaining it these days. Okay. Now, if you're not getting adequate dietary protein, and you can't, you're like over full. I mentioned just a bit ago, supplement with essential amino acids. That can be a logical next step. And I know a lot of women ask, well, what about branch chain amino acid supplementation, BCAAs? If you're not eating adequate dietary protein to make it to your body weight, your ideal body weight, in pounds, in grams of protein, you have no business doing branch chain amino acids. You need all of them. So most women in our community who are not, say, Ironman athletes, who are not, you know, already eating adequate muscle protein amounts and high enough calories, they don't need branch chain amino acids. What they need is essential amino acids. So if that's you, Make sure that you know the distinction. So if you're not getting adequate dietary protein, supplementing with essential amino acids is logical. First next step to reduce the confusion again on supplementation, branch chain amino acids and essential amino acids are not the same. A select few amino acids are classified as branch chain amino acids. If you're supplementing because you're not consuming enough Through food alone, you need all of the essential amino acids to dance together, not just branch chain amino acids. If you're of the bodybuilder status, you're eating protein around the clock, you're hitting your number with high quality protein, then supplementing with branch chain amino acids may be something you do want to consider. One amino acid that seems to always outweigh others or stand out for muscle gain in older adults is leucine. And while you can get adequate leucine in meals, you know, at least 2.5 ideal is a day um, minimum, but at least that 2.5 ideally at meals. So we're talking if you have chicken breast, you have a hamburger, you have a steak, you're probably getting that very easily. And if you want to 
really do well for your muscle, you want to have about five grams a day. That's ideal. If you're eating limited animal protein, it's going to be harder for you. It's it's really hard because plant-based protein sources don't carry much leucine. So even though often I will choose, say, flipping 50 pea protein, right? That's great. It doesn't have a high leucine content, though, a leucine protein profile. However, my lunch and my dinner are animal protein. So I'm covering that, covering that. I've got well over five grams of leucine coming in from those sources daily. I'm not like losing anything. I'm getting some additional leucine from that uh, morning protein to add to the total, but it's not giving me over the threshold for that particular meal, but I'm still okay, right? So Think about what's true for you. But this is, again, where the essential amino acids come in. And I'll put the link in the show notes of the one that I like, and you'll find that on flipping50.com forward slash resources, the things I know and love and use myself. All right, let's talk a little bit about sleep because the importance of that, it is the queen of recovery. We'll talk more about recovery coming up. If you're not sleeping, your cortisol testosterone and your growth hormone all suffer. And these are all part of your team, team muscle building for you. Cortisol acts to break down muscle after a single night sleep of deprivation or night of sleep deprivation, your body is working against you. If you are a push hard and get through it, no matter how you feel woman, it's likely your cortisol level is worse. Chronic cortisol issues, whether too high, but often that is followed by too low, are not the Goldilocks that you need. You need to be in that middle. Testosterone and growth hormone both are crucial hormones for muscle growth. They are what we call anabolic hormones, meaning they help build muscle up. They're released in your deepest cycles of sleep. We go through four different phases of sleep and we do the four phases about five times a night that those cycles each last about 90 minutes. So if you happen to be sleeping with uh, an aged dog who gets up at night or a spouse who snores, or you still have the baby monitor to hear your teens come in (laughs) or do whatever they might be doing on the couch, right? That's not helping you, girlfriend. So you really want to take steps to get better sleep, higher quality sleep, because if you're getting robbed of that third and fourth phase of all of those cycles, you're not releasing testosterone. And this, the testosterone growth hormone, they're boosted by the resistance training you're doing. However, it's like the sleep needs to release these hormones to seal the deal so you get the benefits and rewards from the exercise that you do. So whether you're woken up regularly by menopause, low blood sugar, an aging dog, teenagers, snoring partner, you got to take some steps. So whether that's a sleep apnea machine, a different bedroom, select nights when you can catch up on sleep or it's focused menopause sleep plan, make it a priority. So let's go into the sister to sleep, and that is just recovery. And recovery, we talk, or rest, we talk about in so many places where it's important to your workout. Between your sets, like if you're doing a chest press, a bent over row, and a squat, you've picked those exercises to do you want to take time and maybe throw a core exercise in there because the sweet spot for rest between stimulating same muscle groups in most protocols is two to four minutes. That's the sweet spot, whether you're a beginner, you're more advanced. So if I do a chest press, a bent over a row, a squat, and I'm going to do a plank, by the time I come back to the chest press, because each of those will take about a minute if done well, and then I transition, Then I've been resting for about three minutes. Boom. Perfect. And yet, not been sitting there staring at my screen. Been busy, been efficient, been effective. That workout time is gold, right? 
So it's between set that matters. There are even some studies now showing that doing sets, like doing a single set with a lot of volume, a single set of, say, bent over row might be about 36, 35 or 36 repetitions. We'll never do it again during the workout. We're done, done, done. But we're going to reach absolute muscle fatigue while we do it. Those within sets even sometimes are pausing after five or six repetitions and resting for five or six seconds and then going on. And it still shows very beneficial, especially for women, because volume really matters now more than ever for women over 40. There's also rest and recovery that occurs between workouts. And now I've talked many, many times, part of the After 50 Fitness Formula for Women addresses the fact that 48 hours is no longer enough for the majority of women and men as well. We do better resting 72 hours. So if you find you just don't feel as strong during that second workout of the week or you by the third if you're doing three, or you feel like the same same weight you pick up, you can't do as many repetitions. It's like instead of getting better, you're getting worse over time, at least during the week. This may be just an indication or sore, kind of always achy and sore. Wait another day. See how you feel. So yes, it does mean you may only be doing Monday and Thursday workouts every week instead of Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But do you care if you get more fit because of it? So we forget many times that it is not the exercise that makes you fit. It's the recovery that occurs between the exercise that makes you fit. So if you skip the recovery, you don't get the fit. There is no pass go, no collect $200, no fit into your pants in the back of the closet. None, not not happening. Okay. So rest is really important. And so many women feel like, oh, I feel like I'm so tired anymore. I have to rest so much more between workouts. So that makes progress slow. And I'm quoting a woman who said this, and this is the opposite. So the thinking is wrong. The adequate recovery so that you can come into your next workout stronger, fresher, ready to lift more or do more repetitions means you will get fit faster. If you don't allow that recovery, you will not. You're breaking down, breaking down, breaking down. You can't get stronger. You can't have a faster metabolism without gaining more lean muscle tissue. Super important. Okay. This leads me to the last one. So rest and recovery between all of your stressors. So let's take, for instance, you know, people training for a marathon and not that you are, not that you even should be, but we've got two sets of people. We have subjects training for the marathon and then the rest of the day they could lounge by the pool, take naps, have their private chef cook for them. And then we have the other group who have to go off to a stressful job. They have meetings all day. They're on their feet all day and uh, also have to bounce back and be ready for that next workout. Which group do you think performs better in the marathon? right? It's not rocket science. I think you probably have a figure out. It's the group that rests in between low stress, but yet that's not how we treat ourselves, right? We don't take a lighter workout on days when we have stressful things going on, or let's face it, weeks or months when stressful things are going on. And we need to, we need to say, I won't get more fit by pushing harder and just checking the boxes like I got all the workouts in, even when I was super stressed and even when I was working overnight in the ER room as a nurse. And no, just no. So you've got to use common sense. You got to use a little science I'm giving to you now. Rest and recovery is the most undervalued component of fitness that there is. And after 40, we no longer are going to get away with abusing it or not using it at all, depending on how you want to think about it. Let's talk a minute about the mental game of gaining muscle versus losing weight after menopause is tricky. And it was there when we were 20 and 30, but now there's more urgency. I mean, right? First of all, it feels like it came on all of a sudden without our control. Like you didn't go on vacation and eat bonbons and now understand why you gained weight. It's just like, wait a minute. Why is this happening to me? I don't deserve it, right? 
Flipping 50 offers a 12 week strength gaining or strength, yeah, gaining strength, gaining strength training program built for women in menopause. Nowhere in the description of the program does it promise weight loss. However, there usually is some kind of positive change in body composition and of inches, even if not in weight. Yet occasionally, a woman participant, student in the course will say, because of decades of conditioning that exercise burns calories and the reason to do exercise is weight loss, and she will say, I haven't lost any weight, even though I feel stronger and my clothes fit differently, a little disappointed. And I say, quote unquote, that is like literally a statement in a in a Facebook post. And I want to point out, this is both ridiculous and it's not your fault. So I'm not poking fun at, if you happen to have done that comment and it's you, I'm not poking fun. I'm not being condescending in any way, but it is completely not your fault. The positive changes though, did you hear it? They were minimized. Like this happened good, this happened good, this happened good, but I haven't lost any weight. Like as if that's the most important thing, the power of a number on the scale giving false indication that you may be successful, that took over right? So when I say fleeting success would happen, because if you've lost weight while you're strength training, you may do that, but you will do it at a much slower pace because you are, even as you're losing fat, you're gaining lean muscle. And so you're not going to see the scale change nearly as quickly, but it can also be false if you're seeing weight loss and you didn't actually gain lean muscle, and maybe you're not even maintaining it, but you're losing lean muscle, then that will come to bi- back to bite you in the butt. It will take time. It'll, perhaps it'll take a lifetime if you let it and you don't decide to change it to overcome this challenging conditioning that ultimately weight loss should be the goal and the measure of success. And what if you never lost weight? you were at this weight, you're out right now. Would that be an awful life? I'm leaving a big pregnant pause there. I didn't have my mic malfunction. But I think so many of us are like, focus on weight loss and I want weight loss and I really want, mm, ah, mm, and I'm exercising for the weight loss and I'm trying to get as healthy as possible. But then unwilling to make certain other changes that you're told scientifically have a basis in supporting more muscle, less fat. We don't want to make changes. We think losing weight is the goal. And all day we're thinking about what we eat, what we don't eat, whether that's a good choice or a bad choice or whether we are good or we are bad. It's time to give that up. So whether we accomplish that in our lifetime or not, I don't know. But if you can see yourself getting stronger, if you can ignore the fact that weight loss is something that you do want, and you can do all the other things that make it easier for you to feel good, your mind is your biggest asset or obstacle you have. Deciding to change it and work through that resistance is the heaviest and the most important lifting you will ever do. Will any of us die wishing we'd maintained a certain weight? Will we lie on our deathbeds and regret that and be glad for all the hours of deprivation and trying to diet and exercise into something we're not ever going to be happy achieving? And let me explain that. I've watched women over 40 years, lose weight, some just extremely significant amounts of weight. And yet when they get there, they consciously either let down their guard or they never, ever do. And they're constantly fearful. The scale went up a few pounds. Oh my God, this is terrible, right? And they're worried about gaining it back. They don't actually ever feel comfortable in those clothes they thought they would. And it's mental as much as it's physical. 
But we think that being a certain way will make us happy. We think that fitting into certain clothes will make us happy. But often when we get there, it's not something we can maintain because the way we got there is not sustainable. So I think we're never going to die wishing that we were a certain weight or had been. I think that most of the time when I look back at pictures and see pictures of myself at a time when I know in looking at that picture, I wished I was more defined or thinner or weighed something different or looked different. And now I look at those pictures and think, I looked pretty good. <laughs> I wish I looked like that now. What was wrong with me? Right? So right now is that moment for you potentially in 10 or 20 years. Why not just start stepping into that? Start looking a little bit closer, seeing yourself the way other people see you. Sometimes that's the better lens. I don't think we'll be unhappy or be grateful that we dieted for so long, but I'll let you answer that for yourself. What's the most important thing for building muscle after menopause? If you change just one thing about your physical routine, start weight training. If your weight training without a menopause specific plan matched to your need, start that. Researchers on muscle, longevity, protein, they all agree that the importance of protein is high. However, the greatest among resistance training, protein, supplements to get protein if you're not eating it, the greatest of them is resistance training. Because just simply not resistance training, but eating a high protein diet won't do as much for you as doing resistance training, not doing the other two. And just taking supplements, not eating adequate protein or calories, not doing adequate resistance training, also less effective. So there is something we agree on, provided you do re resistance training with adequate recovery. And remember what that means, recovery between strength workouts, recovery between the strength workouts and the other stressors in your life. We'll put the list of other episodes that you might enjoy here. And right now, if you're thinking about it, you do have a need for strength training. Stronger is open just a few times a year. It's a 12-week strength training program. It is built on the science for women in menopause. And all the protocols are scientifically proven. And we've used them and employed them here in Flipping 50 since 2013. And they are proven to work with our audience as well. What are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 today. You can find the show notes and I would love to hear from you at flipping50.com forward slash building muscle after menopause.